wasn't it nice of her to tell me I wasn't even talking to nobody. Sorry, guys. This is going to be an evening of technical fun. My name is Nancy Easterling. It is my honor to serve as the executive director of Historic Soderly. And welcome one and all to the next installment of our 2021 speaker series at Soderly. It's hard to believe that we started this series up again in 2006. And we have been running ever since with wonderful speakers and sharing interesting topics with you. We're glad you joined us tonight and we hope that you have a wonderful time with our speaker that we are really excited to share the evening with. Um, in fact, uh, Jim, whenever you would like, you could start your um, video so you can join me at the top of the screen and right beside that video button, if you could also click the, uh, the microphone button, let me know that we can hear you too. Can you say something for me so I can make sure? Good evening. Oh, uh, fabulous. Okay, so let me introduce you. I want to make sure we are all set with that before I introduce you to tonight's speaker. We are so excited. And thanks to Jan Briscoe, our board president, who's the person who found this wonderful book and introduced us to, to our speaker tonight. So like Bruce Springsteen, oh. Professor James Decat was born in the USA, New Jersey to be specific. He has a passion for American literature. His master's thesis focused on the American World War II novel. His PhD dissertation focused on Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. For past several years, he's been especially interested in the Puritans and the American antebellum. He regularly teaches both American literature survey courses, as well as special topic courses, including courses on Ernest Hemingway, and the Southern Literary Renaissance, the African-American novel, American social protest literature, and literature of the 1950s and 1960s. So you have all kinds of things that you can talk to us about. He has also taught Holocaust literature and modern African literature for the English majors required global literature course. His Lincoln's Moral Vision, the second inaugural address was named an honor book in 2000 2003 by the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. And early, America, early Black reformers won the National Council for Social Studies Carter G. Woodson Secondary Book Award in 2004. His most recent book that he's speaking to us tonight about is Lincoln and the Natural Environment, published in 2019. But on a just a fun and different side, you have a side that I didn't, I wasn't aware of at first, you have articles on sports and baseball, which I think is fascinating and have appeared in the New York Times, the Providence Journal, Sports History, the National Pastime, Baseball Research Journal, Spitball, the Literary Baseball Magazine, and other publications. His fishing tales had appeared in the water, uh, in On the Water and the Journal of Sports Literature. So you have such an incredible number of topics we could be asking you about. But Jim, we are so excited that you're going to share your book on Lincoln with us tonight. With no further ado, let me pass it over to our esteemed speaker tonight. Take it away, Jim. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay and everything. Okay. Uh, this book that I that was published two years ago, Lincoln in the Natural Environment, is part of a series by Southern Illinois University Press called the Concise Lincoln Library. There are books, oh sure, 100, 150 pages and narrowly focused. Some are on very common Lincoln topics. I'm looking at the list here, like Lincoln and slavery, <clears throat> Lincoln and the and and the and Reconstruction. Um, Lincoln in the Civil War. Others are a little bit less on other aspects of Lincoln that are not written about too much. Lincoln's sense of humor. Lincoln and the immigrant. Lincoln and medicine. Hmm. So when I proposed one on Lincoln and the, and the natural environment, the editors liked the idea because it's a subject that's not written about too much. I've always been interested in env environmental issues. I'm a fisherman, outdoorsman, and I've been interested in my readings and teaching, and especially 19th century writers like Thoreau and William Cullen Bryant, who I'll, whom I'll mention tonight. So 
I wanted to see when I started my research, where is Lincoln on these environmental issues? Yes, he grew up on a farm, but what uh, was his relationship to the environment? <clears throat> so that's what I'll talk about. That, that's what led to the book, and that's what I'll talk about tonight. Now, thank you for coming. Now, Lincoln's life parallels a very important segment of American environmental history. He's born in, on a Kentucky farm, 1809, at a time when 90% of Americans lived on farms. But the nation is changing. It's already changing. By the way, 100 years later, 1900, 30% of Americans lived on farms. By the time Lincoln is born, an industrial revolution had already begun, perhaps initi initiated by Samuel Slater's dam and textile mill, mill, which was built on the Blackstone River in Rhode Island in 1790. By the time Lincoln's born, 1809, the steam engine had been invented and installs on ships that can define, the, defy the environmental forces by traveling upstream against the current. A key symbol of the Industrial Revo Revolution, the locomotive, made its debut when Lincoln was a teenager. That first train went something like 13 or 14 miles per hour. How swift. Now, by the 1830s, uh, Lincoln is a young man, and mills and factories employing thousands of workers has sprouted up, especially in New England, set on New England rivers, cranking out textiles and other consumer goods. And they're having a and that's having a definite effect on the environment. Now, Re Lincoln's relationship to the natural environment was complicated, sometimes problematic. And I think it's still evolving at the time of his tragic death in 1865. His relationship with the environment begins, of course, on Midwestern farms. Uh, Lincoln spent the first 20, and I'd like to give you a slide if I can. Uh, next, I think I hit, okay. Um, now, is that slide, there it is, okay, thank you. Um, no, that's the, that's the book, I want the next slide here. Okay, there's a wheat field, typical of the one that, uh, that Lincoln worked on when he was uh, growing up on a farm. He spent the first 22, uh, 22 years of his life on farms. I think I hit stop, oh no. <laughs> uh, I think I've done something, okay, thank you. All right, um, sorry about that. Technologically, I'm still learning. Uh, he spent the first 22 years of his life on farms, close to and very dependent upon the natural environment. He plowed fields, he planted and reaped crops, and of course he split rails. He was the rail splitter. Uh, by the time he was a teenager, however, Lincoln began to form a plan to leave farming, which he called once stinted living. He detested the arduous labor of, a, of life on a farm and found farm, farming isolating. He once claimed that he had developed a sympathy for slaves because his father had treated him like a slave on their family farms. So he understood being forced to work uh, and sympathized with slaves who had to do that their whole lives, lives with no escape. He also somehow acquired literacy and developed an interest in books. Um, when the circuit court went through his region uh, in, in, you know, it went through his region in Illinois, he would attend trials and that sparked an interest in law. He learned to read, he achieved literacy in his six months of formal education. Uh, and he also came to realize that those who lived close to the environment were vulnerable to it, a drought and early or late frost could devastate a farming community like his. And he learned an extremely painful lesson about living close to and dependent upon the environment at age nine, when his mother died of milk sickness. Milk sickness was caused by cows ingesting snake root plants, which grew in the wild. The cows would eat the snake root, the cows would not get sick, but people who drank the milk from the cows would get sick 
his mother died. He helped his father build his mother's coffin at age nine. He continued to work on the farm. At age 19, he got a taste of a little different kind of life. Uh, he and a friend were hired to propel a river a riverboat filled with farm pr produce down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, which was a growing port city with eateries, theaters, hotels, bars. He got to see New Orleans, a different kind of landscape. Uh, his salary included a return trip deck passage on a steamboat, which introduced him to the power of machines. Uh, so by that time, age 19, Lincoln was thinking about leaving the farm, divorcing himself from that direct contact with the natural environment. Uh, when he was 22, he was no longer bound to his step up to his father and stepmother, and he left the family farm never to return. He moved to New Salem, Illinois, a town on the Sangamon River, where he worked first as a clerk in a store, later as a postmaster. Uh, interestingly, his first community project included involved in a, a, a plan to uh, engineer, to straighten and deepen the Sangamon River so that it could accommodate larger vessels. Large vessels could not go up that river. And if large vessels could not dock, uh, you know, uh, but New Salem, New Salem could not become an important town. So some townsmen had this plan, if we can only straighten the river and deepen it, uh, bigger ships could come, bigger boats could come and dock and our town will be that much uh, better. Uh, but the plan didn't work, <laughs> it failed. Uh, nonetheless, he had found an issue for, for his first political campaign. The issue, internal improvements, okay? Lincoln's first campaign document was his campaign statement in the Sagamon Journal, March 1832, quote, time and experience have verified to a, to a demonstration the public utility of internal improvements. Soon he joined the Whig Party, which advocated internal improvements, creation of railroads to span the country, canals, roads, bridges, to enable the transportation of manufactured goods across the expanding nation. Um, get those textile mill, the, the, the products of the textile mills in the East Coast and be able to, to ship them out to the Midwest or to the South. We needed trains to do that. We needed good transportation to do that. Uh, he also, uh, the party also believed in high tariffs on imported manufactured goods to protect American manufacturers. Uh, these way, these in internal improvements were a way of reshaping and subduing the natural environment, connect, con uh, connecting waterways uh, with man-made canals, shortening distances between two geographic points via railroad tracks. Uh, Lincoln also extolled machines like the steamboat and locomotive that were reshaping the American economic and environmental landscapes. Now, neither the Whig party nor Lincoln considered the environmental effects of this industrial that this industrial revolution was having as it overspread the nation. Example, creation of dams that powered mills on New England rivers had a damaging effect on the migration of anadromous fish like salmon and shad. They live in salt water, but they need to swim upstream to fresh water to spawn. But if a dam prevents them from swimming upstream, they cannot spawn. Uh, Rhode Island farmers protested the creation of Samuel Slater's dam because it stopped the annual late May salmon run that brought needed protein to the farmer's dinner tables before the season's crop uh, was ready for harvest. Uh, but Slater had friends in the RI Rhode Island legislature and these farmers were not successful. Um, in 1839, Henry David Thoreau, one of the first important environmental American writers uh, and his brother John took a boat trip from Concord, Massachusetts, their home, to Concord, New Hampshire. Thoreau later wrote a book on his experience titled 
a week on the Concord and Merrimack rivers, in which he lamented the disappearance of the shad and salmon from those waters. Poor shad, quote Mrs. Still wandering the sea in thy scaly armor to inquire humbly at the mouths of rivers if man perchance left them free to enter. Gee, when would the dams go away that blocked the salmon? Thoreau hoped that if the shad waited patiently for a few thousand years, perhaps nature will have leveled the Bellarica Dam and Lowell factories and the grass ground river run clear again. Actually, he wouldn't have to wait a few thousand years. Uh, dams have been leveled lately and I'm reading in my fishing magazines that the salmon and shad are going back upstream. They found the, found the rivers that they had lost in the 1840s. Uh, so now by the time the railroad was invented, deforestation was a serious environmental problem in New England. Railroads caused, that's because farmers chopped down trees to clean, to clear fields. They planted crops for several years. They could not go to Home Depot and buy fertilizer. So they just, when the soil went stale, they chopped down more trees and had, a, and had another field. That's the way they farmed. All right, so um, uh, deforestation was already a serious problem in New England uh, at the time Lincoln is growing up. Railroads caused further deforestation. Railroads consumed trees. Trees were cut down to make room for the tracks. Wood from the trees was used to connect the iron rails. You've seen railroad tracks. And the first locomotives ran on wood as fuel not on coal or anything else. The blast furnaces that made iron rails used two plus acres of trees per day for fuel. Those trees had to be cut down and used as fuel. In an essay titled Walking Thoreau wrote, we are accustomed to say in New England that fewer and fewer pigeon visit us every year. Our forests furnace furnish no masts for them. The trees were disappearing. Deforestation was a serious environmental problem in New England. <laughs> it's hard to believe. Today in New, e New England has twice as many trees as it did in 1850. You say, oh boy, we have strip malls, we have neighborhoods. Uh, how could that be? Well, there was a tree shortage in New England by the mid 19th century. Uh, we're better off with New England trees these days. And factories also polluted the air, they polluted the water. Uh, now, the roots of the American environmental movement can be traced to Lincoln's, to Lincoln's lifetime. Uh, the writings of Henry David Thoreau, I've mentioned him, sometimes called the father of American environmental writing. William Cullen Bryant, a Massachusetts native, uh, became a poet, he wrote nature poetry, and he became a newspaper editor um, for the New York Post. So he moved down to New York City, very strong abolitionist voice. But in the 1840s, he began, began agitating. He said, New York is getting too built up. We're chopping down trees. We're making buildings. I think in a very short period of time, the, the population in New York had like quadrupled immigrants coming in, the Irish immigrants of the 1840s, for example. And he advocated, he said, what New York needs is a big central park. People said, oh, he's crazy, big central park. He kept agitating for it. He said, we've seen these parks in European cities like France uh, and uh, London. New York needs a central park. And by the 1850s, there was a central park in New York. Okay, still there. Um, in the 1850s, there was something called an again, an early environmental protest, a big tree protest. Some entrepreneurs chopped down a big redwood tree in California, and they wanted to get a segment of the tree and take it to display it at fairs and whatever to show these, what the California had, these huge trees. People were outraged. How could you kill a tree? As far away as New York, newspapers editorialized against it. So there's a, the birth of an environmental movement. We think of environmentalism as 1960s, perhaps, you know, um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, that book, and some early 
uh, environmental legislation. But as far as back as the mid 19th century, there's a bit of a of a of an environmental movement gaining ground. That's in the background of Lincoln as he's growing into adulthood. Now, by the time he's in his 30s, Lincoln's divorce from the natural landscape was complete. He'd become an attorney, didn't have to go to college to be, or law school to become an attorney in those days. He'd make his living with books and legal documents rather than an ax and a plow. Uh, he married, moved to Springfield, Illinois, Illinois and bought a, a stylish uh, Victorian house there. And if I could go to my, um, there's the wheat field, the next, ah, there's the stylish, look at the stock, boy, from the log cabin we always hear about. Uh, now we go to the stylish, um, the stylish, <laughs> next, okay. Uh, I want to go to the next one. There it is. Uh, to that stylish uh, uh, Victorian home that the Lincolns lived in, in Springfield, Illinois. Quite a big difference, quite a leap from his uh, log cabin in the woods when he was a child. Um, okay, now how do I get back to the, uh, um, uh, all right, how do I, am forgetting, can somebody uh, help me here? How do I get, okay, there, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, technological issue, sorry about that. So he's divorced from his life of farming he has a new career, a new home. Interestingly, in 1844, while Lincoln was living and working as an attorney in Springfield, he paid a visit to one of his child to his childhood home in Indiana. He composed a 24 stanza poem about the experience. Now, it's I'm not going to read the whole 24 stanzas, but I'll show you a couple of. Um, couple of verses from it. Okay, maybe you can see those, um, if we can get those on the screen. Okay, next. Okay, this is the first and the last draft. My childhood home I see again, and gladden with its view, and still as memories crowd my brain, there's sadness in it too. Of course there'd be sadness, his mother's death. The poem at 24 verses, the last verse says, the very spot where grew the bread that formed my bones I see. How strange old feel on thee to tread and feel on part of thee. Okay, so he still remains somehow connected to his childhood home. If I can get myself back on the screen here now. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, uh, he had the stylish Victorian house, you know. Um, a lot of his most lucrative, he's still working as an, uh, as an attorney, and his most lucrative cases involved railroad companies, so he was a supporter of the railroad companies in that way. Um, he made speeches about internal improvements and, um, you know, including the steamboat and railroad. In 1838, he delivered a speech at the Washington State Agricultural Society in Milwaukee and asserted the need to bring new machine technology into agriculture, steam plow, for example. But as that poem shows, the natural environment had not completely left Lincoln. It had made a stamp, it had made its mark. Um, throughout his career, he relied on nature imagery in his speeches, in his stories, in his writings to get his points across. Now that's partly because he's writing, he's speaking for or writing for audiences that were familiar with agriculture and farm work. That's part of it, certainly. But it's also part of his makeup, okay? Um, his first recorded anti-slavery statement appears in a letter he wrote to his friend Joshua Speed's sister, Mary. Lincoln and Joshua were traveling on a, ri a riverboat that had slaves aboard it, um, whom Lincoln described as, quote, chained six and six together like so many fish upon a trot line, a nature image 
to convey what those slaves look like. In 1854, Lincoln opposed the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act because it feared it would, he, he feared it would open previously free territory to slavery. In one speech against the act, he used cattle to get his point across. He was familiar with cattle. If we tore down the fence separating our land and your cattle were without water to drink, they would cross the property line into my land and drink at my pond. So too would slave owners move into previously free territory. So he's using nature imagery in his speeches. Lincoln's most famous speech, the Gettysburg Address, of course, okay? Um, and according to Gabor Borit and Gary Wills, two scholars who wrote outstanding books on the Gettysburg Address, um, Lincoln relies on the rhythms of the natural world to, to make his point. The nature, the nation was conceived in liberty, um, but now it's in birth, born but now it's engaged in a great civil war that's destroying it, death. But he hopes at the end of that speech for a new birth of freedom, rebirth. That's something he understood very, very much growing up on farms and it worked his way into that famous address. Okay, certainly the most important element, the most important event in Lincoln's lifetime and his political life is the Civil War, which occupied his entire presidency. Uh, contemporary environmental histories refer to the war as the most catastrophic environmental event in U.S. history. We didn't have to endure the 20, uh, on American soil the 20th century wars as Europe had to, so we were spared for that. Uh, the greatest environmental catastrophe, some historians say, was the Civil War, which devastated especially the Southern landscape. Um, in his first inaugural address, March 1861, Lincoln spoke against war. We are not enemies, but friends, he told the South. But in April, the war began. On July 1st, 1861, a few months into the war, Lincoln told Congress that he hoped for a quick and decisive victory on to Richmond with the Union Army to defeat the Confederate Army in its path, take over the Confederate capital, and restore the Union. War over. That plan ended in the Union defeat at the First Battle of Bull Run. Yes, the Union troops limped back to Washington in defeat. This is going to be a long war, a devastating war. Still, he was reticent to commit to the idea of a total war. His commanding general earlier, early in the war was George McClellan, who advocated, a West Point grad, who advocated a war based on what McClellan said, the highest known Christian principles. Christian war seems to me an oxymoron, but that's how McClellan put it. We can have a war devoted to Christian principles, which meant, in McClellan's mind, no civilian deaths. Soldiers fighting it out on the battlefield, yes, no civilian deaths. No sacking of cities, no destruction of the natural landscape. The f war would be fought on designated battlefield and involve only the soldiers. But that plan produced a long stalemate and a stalemate was in the South's best interest. Hey, if we can keep this war going, Northerners will get tired of it. Say, let the South go, let them be independent, let them have their slaves. The North will be slave free, slaves who escape to the North will be free, let the South go. Uh, as the death rate increased, the body numbers piled up. Uh, so Lincoln was concerned about that. Now, after the Battle of Antietam, September 1862, Lincoln sacked McClellan, he fired McClellan, who later, later ran against him for president in 1864. And he announced a preliminary emancipation proclamation that would take effect January the 1st, 1863. And he also took the advice of some of his more aggressive union generals, Ulysses S. Grant, Philip Sheridan, 
William Tecumseh Sherman, they advocated a more aggressive war. Summer of 63, Grant and Sherman waged the Vicksburg campaign, which included raiding plantations and killing livestock. Uh, he, uh, Sherman said, the land is devastated for 30 miles around, he boasted Sherman. He destroyed the whole landscape. Sherman's military masterpieces were his attack on Atlanta, which he burned virtually to the ground. You see that in Gone with the Wind. He burned the city virtually to the ground. And then subsequently, his march to sea. His troops raided plantations, tore up railroad tracks. He left Atlanta smoldering in ruins, the black smoke rising high in the air and hanging over a hanging like a pal over the ruined city. Uh, then his army moved north and east, smashing things to the sea. These are his words, smashing things to the sea. Uh, if we can take a look at the uh, next uh, uh, presentation. Um, okay, um, I think that's a little bit out of order. I'll have to go back to that one. But um, uh, there's Sherman's march to the sea. That's a photo of what the Union Army left. It looks like an atom bomb went off. That's how devastated the landscape was after that event. Um, okay, if I could just go back to full screen, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so you get a sense of what that landscape looked like, the march to sea, the devastating environmental effects. Okay. Um, uh, one <laughs> contemporary environmental landscape estimates that 2 million of the South's trees were destroyed during the war, lost in forest fires, used to create fortifications and corduroy roads on which the wagons would travel over a muddy track, uh, and um, destroyed by cannon fire, chopped down. Uh, rivers were polluted during the Civil War. Lincoln learned a very harsh, harsh environmental lesson during the Civil War. There was always a large army in Washington to protect the capital, obviously. They camped along the Potomac River. That's where armies camped along waterways so they'd have drinking water and whatever. Well, the you get a, an army of 50,000 troops living by the Potomac River without indoor or outdoor plumbing for toilets, you can imagine what happens. Potomac River water was pumped into the White House untreated. And Lincoln's son, Willie, died from typhoid fever, probably from water poisoning, okay, that uh, occurred, you know, because of the Potomac River water being polluted, you know? So he learned a hard lesson. Um, but perhaps during all that death and destruction, uh, Lincoln had opened himself up to an environmental ethic. During his presidency, he remained connected to the natural environment in two ways. One, reading. He read travel narratives. I mentioned William Cullen Bryant's poems. He loved William Cullen Bryant's poems. Uh, during the summers, the White House was hot, air was humid, the water, the river smelled. And Lincoln tried as best he could to escape from that on most evenings, you know, in the spring, summer through September or so, he, he had a, a Camp David, if you will, a summer White House. It was called Soldier's Home. It originally was a plantation outside of downtown Washington. The US government had acquired it as a home for wounded vets of the War of 1812. They recovered there. Now, by the middle of the 19th century, it was no longer a vet's home. It was a government property. James Buchanan had used it as a kind of Camp David. 
and Lincoln too on summer nights would get in his carriage and ride out to his Camp David, soldier's home, take walks, read, enjoy the air. Uh, I think there is a, um, okay, no, got to go previous, <laughs> previous. It's not that clear if you can put that on the screen, please. That's soldier's home. Okay, if you can get that visual um, on your screens. It's, uh, no, not the net, uh, there it is. Yes, that's it, soldier's home. It's a little, the picture's a little blurry, but you can see a beautiful, beautiful, what was once a, a, a huge estate surrounded by trees where Lincoln could take walks, uh, read, relax. He did work on speeches, sure. Sometimes he had his secretaries out there with him to work on speeches. Uh, so, uh, in fact, he once invited Frederick Douglass to meet him for tea at Soldier's Home. Douglas was busy. Let's do a rain check. By the time the rain check came, Lincoln was dead. So, um, okay, can I go back to, to full screen for a minute? Okay, that was his Camp David. Um, also, okay, this war is going on, devastating the landscape, dividing the country, causing death, ruination. Um, but Lincoln initiated, passed, signed, approved some fairly important environmental measures during the war, okay? Maybe he realized in the middle of the war that in the second inaugural, he made the uh, statement about binding up the nation's wounds, taking care of he who fought the battle, battle his widow, his orphan. So binding up the nation's wounds maybe was environmental too. Um, a, a number of measures that can be put under the category of an environmental enhancement occurred during Lincoln's short presidency. One, he enhanced the Department of Agriculture. For some reason, it was in the patent office. Uh, now it's a, it's, you know, it's part of the cabinet, you know, uh, Department of Agriculture, Secretary of Agri Agriculture is a cabinet member. Uh, then it was buried in the patent office. He enhanced it. It did not yet become a, you know, a, you know, it was not a secretary of, you know, cabinet post, the cabinet position, but he enhanced it, which he said would be an immediate benefit of the large class of our most valuable citizens and the fruitful source of advantage to all of our people. Um, in 1865, working for the Department of Agriculture, Frederick Starr Jr. authored a report on the damage done to forests during the war. It was titled American Forest, Their Destruction and Preservation. So the Lincoln White House was already thinking about, gee, what happened environmentally during this war? Trees were destroyed. What else would happen during the war? How can we fix that when the war is over? And uh, Frederick Starr wrote a, a report, a long report about that. Uh, 1862, he signed into law the Morrill Act, M-O-R-R-I-L-L. -L. It was named after a Vermont Congressman, Justin Morrill. It established what became known as land-grant colleges. The federal government promised like 30,000 acres of land to any university college that would, have, that would establish um, programs in engineering and agriculture. Until that time, colleges and universities were places where you studied philosophy and literature Foreign language, yes, Latin and Greek, not Spanish and Italian. Uh, so he wanted colleges and universities to study agriculture. Yes, we needed uh, study plant fertilization in its infancy, plant rotation. Uh, how do we do away with plant diseases? We, got, we have to study that on a scientific basis. Hey, look what just happened in Ireland in the 1840s when the potato crop failed. 
ooh, we can't have that happen. Mass starvation. We can't have that happen here. So, you know, the Department of uh, Agriculture would help there. And so would these, these uh, land grant colleges that would study agriculture. They would also study engineering. Uh, those railroad, those trains had to go across waterways. You got to build bridges that are going to hold up. We need engineers to design, design those bridges. So the land grant colleges came into being in, the, in Lincoln's administration. In 1863, he established the National Academy of Sciences. It was a group of 50 distinguished scientists who could be called on to investigate any scientific subject and report its, its findings. So the president could order them to investigate some scientific issue. They would study it and issue a report. On the 150th anniversary of, of, uh, of the National Academy of Sciences in uh, 2013, Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysics at New York's uh, Hayden Planetarium, applauded Lincoln in his speech for, quote, setting our nation on a course of scientifically enlightened governments, governance without which we may perish from this earth. So another environmental, you know, science, environmental science would be included. Um, perhaps the most far reaching of Lincoln's policies as far as the environment was concerned, he signed the Yosemite Valley Grant Act. That big tree protest in California, that resonated. And a California Senator, John Conyers, um, he wanted federal land deeded to the state of California. Okay, federal land given to the state. A, quote, upon the express condition that the premises shall be used for public rest, resort, and recreation these natural landscapes would not be built upon. They would not be used for to chop down trees. They would be for public use, resort, recreation. It's the forerunner to the national parks, which appeared shortly, not long after the Civil War, the idea of national parks. Okay, uh, I'll go to the uh, slides again. And all right, we got to get past there. Oh, there's Yosemite National Park, a pretty nice place. Okay, so that's what the um, Yosemite Grant Act started. And from that idea came the idea of national parks, you know, ar around the, the nation to preserve space for hiking, for camping, for fishing, for those kinds of things. Okay. So, um, okay, back to full screen, we can go. You can appreciate the uh, landscape. Um, Lincoln's minister to Italy was a man named George Perkins Marsh. And he created the first important American environmental handbook titled Man and Nature or Physical Geography as Modified by Human affairs. And the book includes chapters on animals, woods, waters, sands, and it details human actions that can damage and have damaged the natural environment. It was a call for protection. Um, it was his minister to Italy. That was not his prime job. Uh, George Perkins March's prime job was dealing with the Italians, not necessarily dealing with the environment, but he took time to write that book. So already in the air, there is some Maybe the war promotes that. So much devastation to the landscape. Hey, we've got to fix it and preserve it um, after the war is over. That's part of the healing process, fixing the landscape. I'm going to conclude with a, an anecdote that I conclude from my book. Um, maybe some of you, who knows, maybe, maybe not, have heard of Elizabeth Keckley. Elizabeth Keckley was a former slave who achieved emancipation and became a very famous Washington dressmaker. Uh, like many female slaves, she learned how to sew, become a seamstress at a young age. Female slaves often did that. 
and she was good at it. When she got her freedom, she set up a business. And the wives of prominent senators, congressmen, oh, when there was a big inaugural ball or something, oh, get Mrs. Kepley <laughs> to make my dress. Uh, she became a friend of Mrs. Lincoln, okay? Um, and she achieved her freedom and she became a friend of Mrs. Lincoln because she made dresses for her. They became pals. Um, now, in April 65, it's only a, a week or so before Lincoln's assassination, just after the Battle of Petersburg, which kind of signals the war was over. And Lincoln and his party um, are taking a carriage ride after the Battle of, of Petersburg to survey the area. And Lincoln sees a big tree that caught, sort of caught his eye. Now, what did that tree stand for? Nature's endurance during mankind's follies like war? Was it a symbol of that? Uh, or the need to grow things again? But anyway, uh, according to Mrs. Keckley, Lincoln and his party stopped on the way back to Washington for a second look at the tree. Quote, this is Mrs. Keckley's, Elizabeth Keckley's words, at the isolated and magnificent specimen of the stately grandeur of the forest. Um, every member of the party, this is the traveling party with Lincoln, was only too willing to accede to the president's request and the visit to the oak tree was made and much enjoyed. Lincoln wanted them to look at that tree. The tree was a symbol of nature's endurance despite the damage done by human beings. Perhaps Lincoln sensed that the natural landscape symbolized by the tree would need care after the war was over, just as the political system would need care um, and businesses would need care and widows and orphans would need care. So had Lincoln lived, perhaps he would have advanced an environmental agenda during his second presidential term that would have helped the nation recover from this terrible, terrible war. Unfortunately, John Wilkes Booth's bullet ended that hope. Uh, okay, I thank you for listening. I guess we can turn it over to Q&A, is that right? That's oh. right. Now, every, we have for those of you who have joined us tonight, um, if you didn't sign in in the chat, that is also the place that you can put your questions. So please write any of the questions in you have tonight. Uh, just so you know, Jim, we have some wonderful people joining us. We have some of our descendants from Soderling here, as well as board members, as well as one of our former staff members, Kim, who actually noticed that you talked about the potato famine. So I knew it was a good segue because we're doing potato harvesting at Soderly this weekend. How interesting. But while we're waiting for some of the uh, questions to come in the chat, um, I, it was interesting when you mentioned uh, Thoreau and others who were coming around the same time as Lincoln. There, you know, and what do you, do you remember ever reading anything from Lincoln specifically about Thoreau's writings or about the work that Olmsted was doing in Central Park and other places? Did he ever comment on any of those specifically? There's a book, I don't have it with me. I, I have it at home and not in my desk here at work, but it's called Reading with Lincoln. And uh, the author makes a list of the books he believes Lincoln read, not only books, but Shakespeare's plays and so forth. Uh, he did read William Cullen Bryant's poetry. He liked very much. Thoreau is not on that list. Thoreau was not as well known a character in his day and age as he is today. Uh, so you can go back through that list and maybe find some uh, writings on the, on the American landscape, certainly by Br William Cullen Bryant, his nature poems that Lincoln loved so much. Uh, but I don't think he, at least this writer speculates that he did not read Thoreau, unfortunately. Well, I was certainly wondering. Now, you know, it's interesting listening to your uh, first times when you're talking about Lincoln. It seemed like in a way he was trying to tame 
the environment more so like you know uh just yeah. like when i when i was growing up um and i'm dating myself you know all of us everybody my age were eating those processed foods that were supposed to make life so much easier i think that he was at that time when they were trying to um tame the environment and make a lot of improvements but as you pointed out how many how much we were damaging i thought mm -hmm. it was so telling when you mentioned that there are twice as many trees in new england today yeah. as there were during his lifetime that is that's what i got from reading that's uh, so in a couple of places yeah wow i uh, so Jan Briscoe, our board president, did have a question. She said, do you think Lincoln would have become more of an activist about the environmental impact of industrialization along that same term? Uh, well, I think he was certainly pro-industry. You know, he believed in the train and, and he believed in uh, those the telegraph, uh, those kinds of technological developments. But I think I really do think he realized the need to that healing the country would have to be environmental as well as spiritual and political and racial. Uh, so I think uh, there were some at least indications in those last two years with some of the measures that he approved, signed, initiated, that he was he was starting to go green. There's a debate about that. Uh, an article in the Washington Post, I was quoted in it a couple of, oh, maybe a year and a half ago, was there was debate between Scott among scholars was Lincoln a, a environmentalist president or not? Sometimes you list you look at list of environmental presidents and he's on it. One person interviewed in the article said no, he was a disaster for the environment. And if you look at his support for railroads, he he was the commander in chief during a war that was the most devastating uh, event in American environmental history. So if you look at things like that, you can say, no, he was not an environmentalist. But others claim that he was. They put him on the list of environmental presidents with Teddy Roosevelt, uh, you know, and uh, and others. So, you know, take your pick. <laughs> yeah, um, you had mentioned Soldiers Home and, and Jeannie Pertle, our Director of Educational Programming Partnerships, did mention for those of you who may have visited or have not in the DC area, uh, if you look up Lincoln's Cottage, it is now um, no, owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Yeah. And you can go visit now. And it is at a higher elevation and just enough out of the city that you can see why in the heat of the, the summer, it would have been a place that you would have wanted to escape to. And I almost have to wonder as you were telling the story about how things were progressing, do you think his time there getting back to a more natural environment during such a difficult and trying period may have been the impetus for mm. some of the environmental acts that he did later, realizing there was healing in nature? Yeah, I think so. What healed him, what made him feel good at the end of a terrible workday, you know, messages that thousands of troops were killed, an army defeated. Uh, and to go to soldiers' home and enjoy a walk along a nice wooded path, I think would have, you know, energized him a little bit and realized that, hey, the natural environment, as Thoreau and others were saying at the time, the natural environment can heal us, could make us feel good, make us feel better. So I think so. Um, when you talked about the land grant colleges, I don't think I had realized before now that there was a pragmatic bend to what he, you know, what you needed to be able to do. Not just thinking great thoughts with philosophy and theology, but you needed to study at, at these colleges. They had to have um, engineering and mm -hmm. agriculture, and those kind of seem like they're on different sides of an environmental issue in in many ways. So I don't know if it was again about, do you think that was more about understanding the environment or still kind of taming it a little bit to our own uses? Well, a little bit of, I think, sure. A little bit of both as a matter of fact, you know, um, we did need to get agriculture on a better environmental, in better environment, environmental shape. We couldn't keep chopping down trees 
uh, we couldn't risk plant and soil diseases like the one in Ireland in the 40s, in the 1840s. So, you know, I think that's, that's certainly part of it. Uh, and the land grant college is extended. You know, I, I have degrees from the University of Rhode Island and that was a land grant college 1892. So the law stayed in effect for many years uh, after the Civil War. Uh, and, you know, as long as those schools studied engineering and agriculture, they got the federal acreage. Um, so. That's fascinating. I did not realize that. So, so I had no idea until you told us tonight that Yosemite had its first Preservation Act under Lincoln. But to, under, to make sure I understood correctly, this was the federal government giving it to the state. At what point was it under Teddy Roosevelt that it went back to federal to be part of the national park system? I believe so, yes. This is sort of a forerunner. The idea that we take public space and preserve it. It's a park. It's not going to be for collecting lumber or doing anything like that. It's going to stay pure as it is. Uh, that was the impetus uh, behind the Yosemite uh, forests, you know, preserving the Yosemite forest. And then it was just only, I don't know, a dozen years later or so that the idea of national parks came into existence. I think it was in the Grant administration, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so we have national parks all over the place now, you know. Uh, some are in natural settings, but others are, you know, not necessarily historic settings and so on. So I think, uh, uh, I don't know if Lincoln had that in mind or not, uh, but, um, you know, California congressmen thought it was a good idea to preserve that, especially, you know, uh, after the, the big tree protest and whatever in California. We need to preserve these forests. People need them for escape, to go fishing and hiking, you know. Um, one question, I, I, and you may not know the answer to this, but um, you talked about the extreme natural devastation of the Civil War and this mm. picture was just, just shown. Yeah, that is it wouldn't have happened under Lincoln's time, but do you know if there, were, if there were ever any efforts to try to restore on a federal level or the, any of those environments that were so devastated by the Civil War? I never have heard of anything. I didn't know if you had. To try to restore those environments? Correct. Uh, gee, I, I, that I don't know whether it was just left for nature to fix itself, more trees to grow, whatever, you know. Um, but there wasn't, I don't think there was ever a, a nationwide uh, re recreate, you know, recreate the forest after the damage during the war. I don't think there was a conscious effort like that. Uh, again, when Grant became president, the idea of preserving certain spaces as national parks came into being. And maybe that has, maybe the Civil War had something to do with that. I don't know. Well, uh, J.M. Briscoe had mentioned that clearly Lincoln's childhood laboring on a farm led him to be the leader he was, as you point out. And sometimes um, in our lives, don't we make a full circle? Things mm -hmm. that we move away from when we are younger because we want a different life. We realize as we get older, there is something good. And, and sometimes as you, as you well pointed out, some things that we're healing. And I think he was coming to that, to that way of looking at things through, through his eyes. And it's, we'll always wonder, and all of us have wondered what would have happened if, what would have yeah. happened. I mean, you look at that poem that he wrote. Yeah. He rejected farming life. I want out of there. I feel it's stinted living. I feel like I'm worked as a slave. But then he writes about it and says, yeah, that's me there. You know, that 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 landscape is part of me, you know, when he goes back to visit his childhood home. And I think that's what he came to see, you know. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for giving thank us you. a perspective. You know, I what well, we love when you when you were reading the facts together, just knowing that two thousand trees were lost during the Civil War. There, these these are things that we're not thinking about the devastation that has been created, not just emotionally but to the environment, and that that Lincoln and others saw. But you gave us a different way 
of looking at someone that we're always learning about that certainly shaped our nation in mm. so many ways. And we're so grateful to you for taking the time well, to, try to do this with us. Thank, thank you. you for, thanks for inviting me. You know, um, again, we were so lucky to have avoided the 20th century wars on our soil. Look what happened. Japan, Europe, devastation. Nobody, uh, except for Pearl Harbor, nobody attacked, dropped bombs on our cities. You know, so we were lucky in that sense. Uh, and we go back and look at the Civil War as really the maybe the worst the most traumatic environmental of, uh, event in our history. In a sense, we're lucky <laughs> compared to the European nations, say, that had to endure the two world wars, you know? And again, a perspective that so many of us would not necessarily think about, about the environmental and the, the de devastation of space and all that we know of that happens in war and that mm. he had to see and he lived through and that shaped him. Yeah. But again, thank you so much. And thank, thank you. To all, all of you who joined us tonight. Uh, next week, we have another wonderful presentation. Maya Davis is going to be joining us next Wednesday on the 15th. We hope you can join us then. But until then, we hope all of you have a wonderful evening. Jim, again, thank you so much. We are so thank grateful. You. Good night, everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night.